I just want to say again how grateful I am for the opportunity to be with you. And I know that we're not in the same building together, but we're together in, in spirit. We're together in uh, the, best, the best way that we can be. I hope that what we have to talk about today is useful to you. I, I hope it will be. Um, as you see on the screen there, the title of the lesson is Faith Comes From Hearing. And when we think about the world we live in today, we live in a world where there's a sad shortage of faith. And uh, that sad shortage is due to a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. We read, as was ably read, and I want to uh, give my thanks to the young man who read this morning. Um, as we think about this text in Romans 10, 14 through 21, there's a verse that just kind of sticks out to us there. And that verse is Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. What Paul lays out in this text is also a, a need or a kind of a process to this. Verse 14 how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? What Paul's laying forth here is a process for the Christian or for the potential Christian. You got to hear the word. And in hearing the word is the only way that one's going to develop the faith that's going to drive them to obey the word of God. Anyway, and in the course of our lesson today, what we will talk about really is just kind of one generic topic, and we'll get to it in just a moment. We're going to approach it from two sides, one a negative and one a positive. But as we think about this hearing that Paul's talking about in Romans 10, the hearing that drives one to develop this faith, that hearing also, and when it produces that faith, that faith is going to lead one to salvation. We think about 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The one who develops the faith that leads them to obey the gospel is one who has given themselves over to it. They have delved into the word. They have heard it and they have obeyed it. We think about this hearing as well. Something else that this hearing reveals to us is that we are in this word, this word that we hear. We become fully supplied for everything. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul writes there, all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. When we hear this word and whatever message that comes from this word, we're hearing God's word and we are being given everything that we need. And as we live in the world today, we talk about a lack of knowledge of the Bible. This word that's given to us is what we need to be sharing with them. Because as we have the opportunity to share it, we're going to be giving them the lifeline that God intended for them to have. And God, as we are aware in, every, in other passages, Acts 17, 30, 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, we know that God wants everyone to hear it. Now, I recognize that, and we'll talk in our lesson today about uh, types of hearing that, that don't bring about faith. We'll talk about the situations that, that will not bring that about. But we also want to see what, what's going to drive the type of hearing that we want to encourage in others. We think about this hearing, and this hearing also allows us to present ourselves approved to God. In 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. And we think about the last, this last verse I've got on the screen here in Acts 17.11. The fact that hearing drives us to seek salvation, the fact that hearing 
drives us to be approved to God, the fact that hearing equips us for every good work. We think about the Bereans in Acts 17, 11. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. What did they, what made the Bereans noble-minded was their focus. What was their focus on? Their focus was on the word that Paul was teaching them. What were they doing every day? What made them noble-minded was what they sought. They sought word of nobility. They sought the word of God. And they checked. They checked the scriptures. They said, we want to make sure what this guy's teaching us is the truth. And as they heard it day to day, they went and checked. They did. They enjoyed what they, they, they knew what they were hearing was the truth. So both the, the fact that they sought word of nobility, the creator and the son of God, their message, but they became noble-minded also because they were seeking something greater than the basic things of this world. They sought that which was on a higher plane. So we think about this, what we see in all of this is we begin with the word of God being taught and we end up with faith. So the question now becomes, and this will be the, this will be the rest of our lesson today. How does one get from the written word of God all the way to real faith? How do we get there? Well, I think what we'll see here is what scripture tells us is that hearing is the way man develops his faith. Now, as we think about this, there are things, as, as hearing is the way that, de that one develops her faith, there are things that will not develop faith. Uh, my genetics are not going to help me develop my faith. They're not going to drive, drive me to hear necessarily either. We think about John 1.13, if you're able to turn over there with me. I'm not going to have every passage on the screen, and I won't reference every passage that I have on the screen. Uh, you can take them for your notes. But in John 1, verse 13, in fact, going back to verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John, at the very beginning of his gospel, is laying forth the idea that the one who's going to come to Jesus and bear his name is going to have to be born of God, which means if we think about these things. Under the old law, genetics mattered. The people of Israel were God's people. The people who were not of Israel were not. So lineage mattered. That changed under the new covenant. We think about what is it. Ezekiel talked about in his letter, talking about the sins of the father not being visited on the son and the sins of the son not being visited on the father. The other side of that coin, uh, one side having sin, the other side salvation is equally true. The salvation of the father will not be visited on the son. The salvation of the son will not be visited on the father in this respect. My children, and we're all, uh, we're, we are either someone's child or we are, we're someone's parent, one of the two, or we've, or we've parented our children out of the house, and we're grandparents, maybe. But the fact that, I, that I've obeyed the gospel, my wife has obeyed the gospel, is not going to save our children. Our children can't coast in on our coattails. I can't coast in on my father's coattails. Genetics won't matter in the grand scheme of things. And that was a point that was driven home hard in the New Testament, that there was a need to give oneself over to Christ and, and submit to obedience in the way that he demanded it. Something else we think about, we say faith comes by hearing, it doesn't come by feeling. As we look around us in the world today, there are many in the denominational world who, and there'll be many who uh, don't claim to be denominational at all, who, who say they have a feeling that leads them to be saved. Yet we know in Scripture that the feel, the feeling 
is not what drove the New Testament Christian. It was faith that came from hearing the word. Now, we think about when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2. Well, that, that moment and in Acts chapter 10, where the Holy Spirit came down on Cornelius and his household, were two very specific moments that had benchmark significance to the, to the church. As the apostles had the Holy Spirit come down upon them, they were being ordained as it were. Sign as, there was a, this was a sign to let people know these are the ones who are going to teach the truth. They will have the message of salvation. You're going to need to listen to them. And in the case of Cornelius and his household, we're reminded that at that point in time, Gentiles are now being given the opportunity to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this was significant moving forward for the church. It expanded the borders of the kingdom to anyone who wanted to listen and anyone who wanted to obey. But those feelings didn't save. And in fact, we think about Cornelius' own family in Acts 10, verse 48. Peter saw, recognized what was happening with them and said, can anyone refuse them water? Them water. Let's, let's get these people baptized. We think about faith also. Faith does not come from the eloquent tongue or the earnest nature of such uh, of the preacher. Uh, the faith needs to be in the message, not the messenger. We're mindful that Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, what did Paul say? Paul, Paul chastised the, the I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am Cephas, I am of Christ. He chastised that mindset, not because of, who, not because of what they had obeyed, but because they were exalting messenger over message. Faith needs to come from the message, not the messenger. Faith in God cannot be developed by hearing something other than the truth. Um, I am reminded of, of something I was told when I was a child. Uh, I had a preacher who was preaching a lesson, and he, he used as an example at the time. Now, I'm sure things have changed over the course of time. We have water, strange watermarks on bills today that make it much harder to counterfeit. But in the day, back in the 70s and 80s, before all that stuff, what they would do in banks is they would take tellers and they would continue to feed them the right money. They would feed it to them. They'd make them handle it, handle it, handle it, handle it, you know, all over the place. They would do nothing but touch a real bill all the time. The point of that was for them to fully recognize by look and touch what a real bill looked like. So when somebody tried to pass a counterfeit bill, they knew right away, this is not true. This is a lie hand it back to them. A faith in God will be developed by hearing the truth, the truth of God's word. We have seen in this pandemic uh, denominational preachers who have encouraged the use of the sinner's prayer in commercials on television and in speeches on television. That doesn't help the Christian obey the gospel. What helps the Christian obey the gospel is having the gospel taught to them, they will develop faith from hearing the truth. We look at these three examples here. This is a type of hearing that did not produce faith. As we think about Acts 7.54, this is at the very end of Stephen's time on earth. Stephen has spent all of Acts 7 reciting a history for the people. He has spent all of this time giving them all the ins and outs, this, these men of the council, by the end of that, they had heard everything. Did, they, did that hearing produce faith? No, because they came to the table ready to be angry at him. They didn't like him. They didn't like what he had to say. And by the end of the chapter, we've got them covering their ears, screaming at him and grabbing him and throwing him down and stoning him. People can hear, but if they don't approach it the right way, they're not going to develop faith. In John 12, 37 through 40, um, John records in, this, in his gospel here this moment where uh, there's a bit of reflection. This is after Jesus has spoken, and as we read 37 through 40 of John chapter 12, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So, the word, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, 
Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Were the Pharisees willing to listen and bend themselves to God's will? No, they weren't. They heard, but they weren't hearing with hearts ready to take in the word. And in John 6, 66, we see a group that had heard the message, but it was too difficult for them. And many turned away. And, and it was, uh, I'm sure it was a discouraging moment for Jesus, but at the same time, it revealed what the word did at that point in time was it served, it served its purpose. Hebrews 4, 11 and 12 talked to us about uh, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword and is a revealing word. It will reveal the heart of man. And in this case, it did. But we think about the type of hearing that what, what kind of hearing will develop faith? Well, first, it's a hearing that wants salvation. A hearing that wants salvation. John 7, 17. Jesus speaking here, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. In other words, Jesus said, if the guy, the person who wants to know, they're going to dig into it. And they're going to know. They're going to want that salvation. Acts 16.30, the Philippian jailer. What does he say? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what, is, what do Paul and Silas tell you? If you believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart, you may. And with that, we, are, we, we see that the Philippian jailer listens, repents as he washes their stripes, is baptized for the remission of sins. His hearing wanted to be saved. More so than that, what we see in ourselves, that, that's a hearing that wants salvation that developed, that is the beginning of the faith. But as we think to ourselves, what is going to keep my hold on salvation? It's going to be my continued devotion to the Word of God. As we talked about earlier in 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 3.16-17, that recognizing that knowing this in and out is going to help me to know my God. It's going to keep me wanting that salvation, not just coming up out of the water and that's it, but it, I'm going to be wanting to get to know him better and better and continue to keep hold of that hope that he's, he's extended to me. Also, a hearing that will develop faith is a hearing that is convinced of being lost. We think about Acts 2.37. They've heard this wonderful lesson. It's not a deep lesson. It's not uh, what we would call today top shelf preaching. Uh, Peter is speaking very clearly and plainly to them. And at the end of his lesson, they are what? They are pricked in their hearts. It now has occurred to them, we killed the Son of God. Brothers, what must we do? What does Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. They were convinced they were lost. Yet Peter said, there's a way back. Yes, right now you're in a bad place, but there is a way out of that. And that way out is to repent, turn from what you've done, turn, turn from what you've been, be baptized for the remission of sins. What'd they do? 3,000 souls that day obeyed the gospel. And they continued in the apostles' doctrine and teaching. Hearing of the love of Jesus. We think about Romans 2, 4. And Romans 2, 4 talks to us uh, just quickly there. Uh, and I, I know I'm moving quickly. Uh, I have I know we got started a little late, but I, I want to try to do the best I can to not occupy uh, the rest of the day. Romans 2, 4, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? When one hears of God's kindness, his true kindness shown in the sacrifice of his son and the desire for him to want repentance, that type of hearing is going to develop a faith. You look further in the letter to the Romans, as we've got on the screen there, Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You think about that love of Jesus. And as we see many in the world today who don't want to, they either say they don't want to know God, they don't want to love God. 
or they don't have the right kind of love for him. When we can properly show them what has been done for them on Calvary's cross, that one who's concerned about the love of Jesus, when they hear about it, they'll, they'll develop a faith. Hearing of the testimony of God, we think about 1 Thessalonians 2.13, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, and we also, Paul writing here, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. How do the Thessalonians feel about the message they were given? Let's remember, earlier we talked about how the Bereans were no, more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, yet the Thessalonians did what, Paul says? You received this as not the doctrine of Paul, not the doctrine of Silas, but the word of God. They heard it and they said, that word that he says, that's the authority. That's the authority. I've got to listen to it. When one recognizes that authority, Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When one recognizes that what we hear from Christ is an authoritative message, it's not suggestion, it's commands. John shows us throughout his gospel. It makes this mention over and over again in his gospel, makes the mention again in his epistles, the basic idea, if you love God, you will keep his commandments. You respect God as the authority, you're going to love him. You're going to do what he says to do. That hearing is going to develop faith. Hearing that what's the gospel explained, I want us to focus on the passage in Acts 8, 30 and 31. The Ethiopian eunuch's on his way home. The Holy Spirit has sent Philip to him. Has sent Philip to him. And what does the eunuch say? Philip, Philip says first, do you understand what you read? What's the eunuch say? Well, of course I do. What are you doing here? <laughs> no, no. He says, I don't have any idea. What he's basically saying is I'm clueless. I do not understand who he's writing about. Is he writing about himself or somebody else? I cannot make heads or tails of this. I need someone to explain it to me. Philip says, okay. Well, good. Let's start here then. Starts there. And what does he do? Scripture tells us he taught him Jesus. What did, what did Philip's teaching develop? It developed a faith in the eunuch because when the eunuch saw water, what did he say? Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? The gospel was explained. His, the, the eunuch wanted it explained to him. He wanted to know, but he just couldn't get his head around it. And we think about uh, Paul in Romans 6, 3 through 5, explaining the significance to the Roman Christian of baptism. What does it signify? It signifies death, burial, and resurrection. Our old man is dying, is being buried, and a new man's rising just as Christ died, was buried, and arose again. Explain the significance of that. Explain the significance of, of the message that drives us to obey that form of teaching that we've been given in verses 17 and 18. Hearing that takes the message personally is going to develop a faith. The Samaritan woman in John 4, and I know I don't have that on the screen, but you think about her. Think about the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. What type of woman was she? She come here and here's Jesus sitting at the well, needing a drink of water. And she doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know her. Yet what does he do? He gives her warts and all. He gives everything to her, the whole kit and caboodle, all, all of her, all of her, pro, all the things before in her life and what's going on with her now. And what does she do with that? Does she run away screaming? No, she runs away actually. She would run away, she walks away, and she gets the men of the town and says, come here. I need you to hear this man. This man's wonderful. What this man has to teach, she recognized in him. She took that personally and realized there was something in him that was not anywhere else. He was different. He was different, and she, she listened to him. But we think about hearing in cases of conversion. We've talked about the group in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, a little bit. 
But what, when they heard the message, what did they do? They obeyed the gospel. Many of them did. We think about Acts chapter 4, there's more. Acts chapter 4, there was more people uh, from that gathering that, that obeyed the gospel. Some more people. In Acts chapter 8, before Philip goes to find the eunuch, what has he done? He has taught the gospel in Samaria. What did the Samaritans do? They heard the word. They took it in. They developed a faith in God. They developed a faith that was going to lead them to obey his word. We think about Cornelius and his household. Their need to hear. They needed to hear the word. Cornelius, from the get-go, wanted to hear it. He had seen enough. That he wanted to know what he needed to do. He wanted to hear it. He wanted to have what he saw in, in the Jews who had obeyed the gospel. He heard and his family developed a faith in Jesus and they moved on from there. We think about how all these things work and, and this is getting one to conversion, but here's the thing. We recognize that in Acts 2, 41, what they do, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Revelation 2, 10, the church at Sperna was encouraged to be what? Faithful until death. So scripture also tells us that there's something beyond just getting this rudimentary faith that drives me to be saved drives me to want to be baptized for the remission of my sins. We need to continue to immerse ourselves in the word, to continue to expose ourselves to it. And as we ex continue to expose ourselves to it, we may not hear it verbally. We hear it when we read, as we read our daily readings, whatever they may be. We hear the word speak to us. And we continue to develop a bond with our God and Father in heaven. And when we continue to develop that bond, we strengthen it. Faith is that bond. As we strengthen that faith, we strengthen that bond. And what does that, what does that enable us to do? It enables us to have the best ally in any time of temptation, our Father in heaven on our side. And we will overcome those things. As we conclude the lesson this morning, I'm not certain if we have an invitation song or not, but as you, as you take the lesson, I hope this is something that as you go out into the world this week, as you have that opportunity, whatever, whatever it may be, realize that there are people out there, just as there were people in the first century who wanted to hear the truth. There are people all over this country and all over this world who want to know the truth. We simply have to take it to them and expose them to the real truth of the word and know that if we do that, and teach, speak the truth in love, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 4.15, that love being a true compassion for their souls. What we will know is this, we'll have done our part, and the Word of God will do its part, as we talked about in Hebrews 4, 11 and 12. It will get into their heart, and it will do what, it, what it's going to do. It will either expose them to be those who don't want to know the truth, or it will take root in them, and it will make them good soil just as we think about the parable of the sower. I'm grateful for your good attention. I'm grateful for the time that you've allowed me. Um, I, I don't know the best way to end, to end a lesson like this other than to say uh, thank you for your kind attention, and I'll pass it back to, uh, pass it back to Rex now.